Hi, welcome to this episode of Smarter Change, provided by Hassan Archer Consulting. I'm your host, Hassan Archer. Each session, we dive into an interview with senior leaders to understand how they have led meaningful change inside their clients, companies, and organizations. I believe lasting change within companies requires everyone to continually assess and evaluate how they get things done in a changing world. And today, I'm excited to speak with our guest, Martina Stone McGaw. Martina Stone McGaw, principal of Martina Stone Consulting, is an organizational effectiveness consultant and executive coach. After a career in research-based consulting and spending time at a tech startup, she now spends her time working with teams and individuals, finding the key areas where improvement will make the biggest impact on both the organization and individual. Martina focuses on effectiveness coaching, leadership development, and team alignment. She works across industries and size of organizations. She hails from New York and is now based in Los Angeles. A fun fact about Martina, which we'll get into later, is she is also a singer in a competitive barbershop chorus based in Santa Monica, California. Martina, thank you so much for joining us here today. Hi, Hassan. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Yeah, we're so excited to talk to you today. So first of all, just to get us started, why don't you give me kind of introduce yourself in your own words, and especially I need to hear more about this barbershop chorus. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so I'm Martina Stone McGaw. I am very passionate about working with individuals, teams, and organizations to find the things that make them better and will make them more successful. So I am an executive coach and I do lots of team alignment and leadership development, meaning let's figure out what it means for your leaders, for your employees to be ready for what's happening now and to be ready for what's next. And to find those little things, what are the small things we can start doing today, tomorrow, next week to get us on our path towards improvement. I am a singer in a barbershop chorus. Yes. There is a underground world of barbershop <laughs> through the United States and the world. And it's a very, very fun hobby that I happen to miss right now. That's awesome. I love the combination of the coaching, the people development, and then you just have this barbershop quartet, which is all about teams and... <laughs> bringing people together in sync. So I think it all goes together quite well. Absolutely. So, so in the work that you do in coaching, leadership development, team alignment, um, you know, the world's changing a lot. We used to say 2020 was crazy. We're now in 2021. Um, tell me a little bit about what the trends are that you're seeing and just changing how, how we're seeing the change in work. How is work being done in different ways today? Absolutely. Work is being done in so many different ways right now. And this has of course been a extremely challenging year for lots and lots of people. But if we care to find some of the silver linings, I think there is a bit of a reckoning happening where organizations are being forced to be really creative about how work gets done, really, really flexible. And to be honest, this is some things that some companies have been doing for years and years and years. And this has also forced companies who are a little bit more traditional and a little bit more rigid to think about, we need to jump into this solution because they were forced to right now. Mm -hmm. I think it has opened our eyes also to the need to really bring the humanness back into work. And I know we hear that in a bunch of different ways and I don't mean that in the cheesy way, but there's been an opportunity that some companies have seized this year to realize caring about the person and the individual all the way down from your new hire first year employee all the way up to your leaders everyone needs to be cared for to be their best this was the year that we realized maybe driving an hour to and from work every day actually doesn't help us do our jobs better mm -hmm. maybe accepting and really even leaning into we all have kids I see a crib in your background. I don't need to pretend that you don't have children. I think you'd feel much more connected to me if I accepted and knew and asked about your children. Mm -hmm. We're seeing that this year, that really leaning into managers saying to their employees, how are you doing? Not in passing, genuinely, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. And what do you need to be your best in this next week, this next month, and then the year of 2020, there's been a lot more creativity about how we can support that, how businesses can support their people in doing that. And I suspect that that will push 
all of work into this new place where that question can be asked all the time, pandemic or not. That understanding that our, we don't leave our personal lives at home when we come to work. We don't forget about a sick child or a sick parent. That's happening at a micro level all of the time. And I have a pretty real belief that the better we support people, the more engaged they'll be, the better results they'll produce for their companies. Mm -hmm. And I think we're on a path, maybe a bumpy path, but a path in that direction. Well, so that's interesting because when I talk to people who own companies, leaders, CEOs, et cetera, um, you know, up until 2020, a lot of them had this figured out, right? Their company was successful, they're making money, they're looking towards retirement, we selling the company, and then this kind of happened and turned things over. And change is hard. It's never easy. If it was easy, you know, the diet industry wouldn't exist because you would just say, oh, I'm going to cut out gluten and, you know, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to make training and it's really easy, but it's not. So how do you help experienced executives understand the need for change? I mean, maybe they see that from monetary or challenges or they read the news, but Understanding the need to change, but then also developing those new softer skills, like you said, like the fact that my employees have kids right behind me and there's a crib. Um, they may need to be home for a sick parent or a sick child or kids aren't in school. How do you kind of get them to embrace that when they've built their career doing things a certain way? Yeah. It's a new way of thinking, and I am not one to say if you just repeat it enough, people will believe it. That's not true. We're in business for financial gains and to create great companies. I am a believer of that. I try to go in with the, with the perspective that there is data that shows that engaged people are exponentially more loyal to their company, will work harder, will put in the extra time, and that produces results. In the same way, there's some conflicting data around this, but in the same way, companies that are doing really well also create really engaged employee bases. That's a, that's a two-way street, it's really interesting. Um, so for leaders to understand that they can pound the pavement on financial gains all day long, that there are multiple routes into that. So efficiencies and you know having the great business plan those are two great options, as are having really engaged, really devoted employees where you know what's working, you know what the problems are, and that you're willing to work through them. To be frank, it's just another path to success. Some mm -hmm. companies will take you up on that and really want to dive into that. Others won't. Mm -hmm. It's a choice like anything else. So looking at engagement of employees, uh, you know, I think that that term is tossed around a lot. In mm -hmm. terms of uh, efficiency and getting the most for your dollar in terms of what you're paying for your people and the work they're actually producing. How do you measure that with a remote workforce? Is that about tools and almost big brother type checking their emails per day? Or like, mm -hmm. how do you do that in a way that builds that connection and that humanity you mentioned originally with your employees? Yeah, I lean much more on the human side of that. Surely there are tools that can do that, but I would say you can check your email a hundred times a day and get nothing useful done. And you can check your email twice a day and have had a very productive day. True. So I'm very not true. one for quantifying necessarily, although there are situations where that's necessary, like, you know, customer service. And there are, there are places where that matters. I would say if in an organization, every manager can say, this is what my four direct reports are working on. This is what's working for them. And here's the challenge they're facing. That tells me that if nothing else, there's communication happening and that an employee feels some degree of connection with someone in their organization. That doesn't mean everyone's going to stay. That doesn't mean everyone's working to full capacity, but it gives me an indication that at least there's a path towards that. And there's mm -hmm. a higher likelihood that those people are willing to work, willing to put in the time, not watching TV all day at home because it's unlikely that their manager would have any real inkling of what's going on with them if that was true. Hmm. It's, it's that silence, it's that not knowing that leads me towards that's when people's attention is straying much more than how often they're checking their email or if they work till midnight or not. Sure. 
Do you think that the changes we're seeing right now with remote work, um, changing how employers and employees relate to each other, are there some people who just, it's not gonna work? And there's some employees that just will not adapt or some managers who won't? Or do you think everybody can be saved and everybody can make it work? <laughs> this is a, I know this is a hard question. I'm yeah, it is. Plot, but I think that's something that people wanna know. Like, will it work for me? Will it work for everybody? Or is this gonna push some hard decisions for businesses? Sure. I think it'll push some hard decisions for businesses. I am an optimist, but I, I couldn't say truthfully that yes, this will be a success for everyone. Um, I believe everyone has a shot with the right tools to improve. I think every manager this moment has so clearly defined, I've spoken to so many teams and managers saying, I don't know how to connect with my employees because I don't pass them in the hall. Let's be real, passing them in the hall saying hi wasn't probably connecting with them either. This moment of remote work has shown how intentional we need to be about that. And that that's absolutely true when we're in person too. We can grow those skills. We can learn what are those opportunities to check in with people. The power of a seven minute phone call saying, hey, Hassan, how's your week been? Nothing about work, just wanna hear how you're doing. Have a good weekend hugely powerful, but it's a skill like anything else. At the same time, will every manager adapt to that? Will every employee be able to be their best for the remainder of time we're at home? Not necessarily. So I just, just understood you correctly. Are you saying that something as simple as honestly checking in with your employee to see how they're doing makes a measurable difference? Yes. That measurable difference is tricky. <laughs> um, there's a lot of talk about ROI in the coaching world, in the effectiveness world. Um, the, surely there are some fantastic stats, but it has been shown in lots and lots of cases that that type of quick check-in, that type of repeated check-in makes a measurable difference. An example of that is when we look at performance management, lots of research has been done that we are going to remove the numerical ratings on performance mm -hmm. uh, reports. We won't do one through five, let's see what that does. The science shows, the research shows that the numerical rating does not matter. What matters for companies who have successful and increasing performance is the quality and frequency of good manager to employee conversations. That's what matters. Are they happening more than once a year? Mm -hmm. And are they good conversations? That is what gets a company on a trajectory to improve their employees' performance quarter on quarter, year on year. So yes, I can say it does. That's incredible. I mean, you know, one of the topics I cover on this show a lot is that it's small changes that make outsized improvements in organizations. Absolutely. And what you're describing, like it doesn't seem like that should be rocket science, but I know from my own career that even that doesn't happen consistently. And it didn't happen before COVID. Even when you're together, I think there was the, hey, we passed in the hallway. I smiled at my employee and said, hi. I interacted with them at the holiday party. You know, maybe we're in the elevator together, but that was kind of like, oh, of course I know what's going on in my organization. But just going that little bit further to have that humanity expressed between the employee and the employer actually makes a difference. That's very interesting. It is. And let me elaborate on that just a bit. It's not necessarily for the sake of that connection. That mm -hmm. connection is huge. But the reality is that that relationship that has some solid foundation of I care about you as a person, you care about me as a person, even just a little bit, it doesn't have to be deep. That's then how you build on really tough performance conversations when they need to happen. Mm -hmm. That's how you build giving candid feedback, good, bad, or ugly. Mm -hmm. That's how you build, we need you to go take this project somewhere unpleasant for a year mm -hmm. because there is that trust and relationship. So to be clear, it's not for the sake of making friends and building mm -hmm. connections at work necessarily. It's because performance is built on top of that, which I think we sometimes, we forget that missing piece. So the relational dynamic will drive real results for your business if you have an authentic relationship with your people and they feel Absolutely. like they have it with you. Absolutely. 
is this something you could capture in a survey or how would you know, like when you go into a company and you do, maybe I don't know if you do a benchmark or what your mm -hmm. process is, but how would you know if that relationship is there and what would you tell someone, an executive listening now, how would they gauge if, it's, if it exists or doesn't exist? Sure. I think you get a sense from, frankly, employee engagement surveys, lots aren't great, but they can be. So if you ask questions in, an, in a survey, do you feel heard by your manager? Do you feel heard by your team? And you can get even more specific. Are you having concrete conversations with your manager about what's important to you and where you want to go in your career? you'll see 20% of yeses in companies. That's, a, that's an indication of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And to also just get a sense of how people are feeling about their work. Do they feel their company's on the right track? Do they feel that there's alignment from leadership all the way down, that they make an impact on their work? Those answers, that's the piece of data that then there's a lot of questions to be asked about the why. But absolutely, you can get a sense of that. That's a big picture snapshot in the same way asking your managers, tell me what your direct reports are working on and what's going well mm -hmm. and not well. That's the micro version of here's actually the data around that. That's awesome, that's awesome. So obviously you've done this a long time and you're very good at what you do. I can hear that in your examples and your accessing of data and research. Um, I wanna hear more about what you've done in this space and maybe some of the successes and the changes that you're really proud of. Absolutely. So right on that line, I'll talk about an engagement project, which is really a top down, bottom up approach, which is what I think made that project successful. It was a financial company we worked with, um, a new leader, raring to go, an executive team raring to go, and an employee base with, frankly, pretty abysmal engagement scores. So we were brought in to figure out from all angles what the heck was going on before devising what the plan forward could be. And what really worked was starting concurrently at the top and at the bottom. One is not more important than the other and change takes a new understanding from basically everyone. So we started at the top with the leadership team. We get them in a room, we say, are you all aligned on your top priorities? Of course not. <laughs> of course, every person isn't saying this is one, two, and three in this order. And we figure out how to get to greater alignment because you can be sure if the leadership team is not aligned about priorities, no one else in the organization is. Mm -hmm. So there's work to be done at the top. Then it would be easy to stop there. But this was a holistic project that I think lent to the success because then we talked to every employee in small groups. And it's really a series of open-ended questions, basically repeating, why are you not engaged? What do you need from your organization? What do you believe won't work about this change or will work about this change? What do you need to see from your team, from your leaders? And that's not to say that that's a pity party. Mm -hmm. It is always with the thought of what do you need to be doing moving forward to create the environment you wanna work in? But from that, we got deep understanding of root causes of what was going on holistically, what was going on in this team, which is different than what's going on in this team, which is different than what's going on in this team. And from there, we could really build the plan forward of we need airtight alignment from the top. We need that communicated down all of the time. And the leaders need to hear what's actually going on. Your employees are doing the work of your business. You can say that that's not true, but it almost always is. Mm -hmm. So to hear what's going on, what happened historically, how did we get here? And to kind of create change in the middle. Everyone needs to start believing something different, but that worked because that, that happened when people felt heard, when people felt that clarity was coming because it wasn't there yet. And when leaders could stand together and say, yes, this is the direction we're going, we are clear and we're gonna make everyone else really clear with us. Now let's move forward. Mm -hmm. So at the outcome of this project, when you finished it up, what would you say um, was different within the organization? Yeah, so the measurable thing from there, like I mentioned, that project started with an engagement survey that was painful. Hmm. A year later, those engagement scores were increased anywhere from 30 to 50%, which frankly is 
wild even to see that from my view that is a huge improvement and so like i said that tells me people feel heard people feel that change is happening or it's coming and that they believe that there's there's good things to come and then with that 30 to 50 percent i imagine that the organization would see more work being done maybe higher quality work more willingness to take on those difficult projects they're probably having better interaction with customers. So you'd probably see some of those filtering effects kind of spreading out from there. Is that generally what you see? Absolutely, absolutely. When you think about just the amount of time people spend complaining about their manager or their coworker to someone because they didn't get say, no one said hi to them in the morning when they walked by. Mm -hmm. When you add that up through a year, that is an extraordinary amount of time. The same way talking about Mm -hmm. and figuring out this team is overloaded with work, how if you don't solve that problem, the amount of time spent sitting in it is exponential through the year. So getting people invested, worrying less about all of those issues, they have more time to give to their customers, to give to the systems, to give to the change. And you need to hear what that is. Okay. Yeah, I'd imagine as a employee, if their mind's not spinning all the time thinking about how frustrated they are and frankly they're not looking for a new job i mean that alone i i'm sure we've all seen organizations where someone smiles when the manager walks by and then they're just hiding the tab in their browser on linkedin jobs yeah and if that's not happening i mean that's a huge thing for you absolutely i've always said that job searching is a job of its own So if you're taking on that job, you are almost certainly giving less of yourself. You're giving less creative ideas. You're not pushing into the two and five year plan. You're just not, that's the psychology. Yeah. So, and as you were doing this change within the company, what was the hardest part about getting that to stick? Because I think there's a lot of consultants and coaches that come in and frankly, bill high rates do work for six months, leave, and then there's nothing that's really changed. So what was the hardest part that you dealt with? Yeah, the hardest part of that change was the expectation of, I would say everyone, both leaders and all of the senior leaders and employees underneath that. So the leader comes in, we get aligned and leaders hope and expect that change is linear from where we are to where we're going. And it's better in the next month and then it's better the month after that. And then yay, we're at this wonderful place. Almost always change is a you. So we're where we are in status quo. We have these lofty goals where we're going and there's probably good reason for it. The reality is that change feels worse and then it feels a little bit worse after that. And then it feels a little bit worse after that. And then weeks and months later is when you start getting on that diagonal path up. Leaders are with so much conviction, which feels like the right feeling, don't believe that, don't want to accept that. And there is a huge amount of frustration Mm -hmm. when they are going up and everyone else is still trying to figure out what this change means for them. Yeah. You will have people who are resistant for the sake of resistance. That's why I answered before. There will be some people who can't get on board with the change and there may have to be a conscious uncoupling, if you will. Mm -hmm. There are lots of people who will want to be on board, but it's too quick. They haven't been asked how they feel about it. They don't know how it affects them day to day. And they're in that bottom of the U just trying to figure it out. And to hear from a leader, guys, get on board. Guys, this is where we're going get on board. That does not work as well in my experience as tell me your thoughts. What about this change do you think will work and what do you think won't work? There's information to be found in the bottom of the U if leaders are really, really curious to find it. But it's that difference in expectation of what change looks like um, that causes a lot of frustration because a lot of companies give up right before it's about to turn. Do you find that the expectation setting is harder for the employees or for the management? I think it's both. I think it's really hard for a leader to hear this is going to take more time and it's going to take a lot more work because people don't just hop on board and and they're just good. Loyalty doesn't work that way. It's also hard for employees to hear that anything is going to be different. Hmm. Change is inherently hard. 
confusion, unknown, cloudy weather is hard, mm -hmm. um, especially for legacy employees who have been saying, I've been doing this for 20 years, I'm probably not going to change. Um, that's what's hard. It's, it's bridging that gap between where we want to go and the goals and all of the good intentions with the reality that it's, it might be cloudy for a while. And the power of saying, guys, it's going to be unclear for a while. And the second we know more, we're going to tell you. And the second we know the structure for the future, we're going to tell you. Lots of companies don't say that. And then employees sit in confusion for three or six or nine or 12 months. So it's hard all around. It's not easy. So what do you think about, um, like, which individuals do you think are more successful making these changes? And then the corollary to that is which teams like, how do you believe the teams will be more successful at making these changes? Yeah, I think individuals and teams making changes, you have to be open to it. If you're going to be the person that sits back and says, no, this has been the company for my whole career, I'm not changing, that fundamentally is going to give you challenges. So you got to be open to it. You also have to be participating in the solution. And that can look like different things. That can be saying, I have an idea for how we can do this let me share that, you'd be surprised in the interviews in that example I just gave you, lots of ideas bubbled up. People want to share their opinion, they just need to be asked. So they need to be contributing to the solution. And also your people, your boots on the ground people also may know some roadblocks that are going to come up. So really, if you are participating fully in seeing the future and figuring out how to get there, um, that makes that work. A team who knows that their leader has the best intentions in mind, mm -hmm. they aren't being lied to, they aren't being fed solutions, but saying, we're going to figure out how we fit into this change. Um, we're going to do it little by little. Mm -hmm. We're not going to jump to the future. We're just going to say, we're going to start to do this particular thing different. I'd say that's also another challenge of change. Leaders can talk about change and talk about the future. And then the people in the seats doing the work don't know what's different for them. So they go back to their desk and they do what they've always done. Mm -hmm. And then there's frustration. So a leader who can share with the team, guys, all of this is the same right now, but this behavior is different. Whatever it is, that is how teams and then organizations end up being really successful. I like that. It's a uh... I mean, it, it's almost like a radically transparent process where you say, mm -hmm. this piece stays the same. Keep doing what you're doing over here. We're changing this. And I think yep. I would imagine that it helps employees feel less like the apple cart's been turned over and it's now all up in the air because it's like, right. I can at least this much I know. Like, I'm okay with this. And a lot of the um, people I've talked to that have gone through having consultants come in, it's like, uh oh, the consultants are here. Everything is going to be different, right? We're going to change everything, and my seat's going to move. My office is going to move. Right. right? I mean, it's, just, it's all completely different. So I like the idea of saying, here's what we're working on here. It's almost like a modular or a piecemeal approach to change where people yeah. can get used to a piece of it before the entire thing is changed in front of them. And I love hearing you say that because that is exactly the work I do with individuals and with teams. When I am coaching, I do effectiveness coaching. I don't do life coaching. I do, how do you need to be effective? What do you need to do to be more effective today mm -hmm. and in your future? And it is, you. we want to dream big. We want to have the vision for where we want to go. But the reality is that the change to get there is a 10% change tomorrow. It's a 5% change the day after that. It's showing up just a little bit differently or putting the gas down on this behavior just a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Change isn't 100%. We don't go from zero to 100. So that concept is a, is a through line of the work I do. Mm -hmm. Of It's little by little, we improve at this, we show up this way, but you have to know what that thing is and you have to know what's not changing. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people, if you were to ask them, my company's in a transformation, here's what's different. I don't think there's a lot of clarity on that answer. Hmm. So for people listening, especially leaders who might be looking at the organization and saying, huh, well, that's interesting. How would they know that they should talk to you? Like what's, what should key them in to say, I need help with my company right now? Yeah, I think it can be a couple things. It can be leaders often know in their gut that there is misalignment in their leadership team, in their organization. 
they often need a third party to come in to kind of be, I, I'm not tied to any of this. I want to help you all feel better about this and sleep better at night. That would be an indication if, if a leader has a feeling that, yeah, I don't know that my executives would say exactly what I'm saying. That would be an indication that a little bit of work could do. A thought where if you're going through transformational change, you, you don't have the capacity to hear from everyone. I understand that. This is not quick and easy work. But to say, I recognize that we're going to be in the down part of the U of change, and we want to understand what we can learn from that. Um, you may not have that resource in-house. So that makes that's a great opportunity to say, let me just bring someone else in. Or when things are generally going well, your business plan is right, your strategy is right, but the pieces aren't gelling and there's inefficiencies that you believe could be improved, that's a time to look at what teams are working with other teams. How does this team need to gel together? Does this team know how to work with this team? Um, there's some just foundational work where the strength of a team of knowing who's on this team, how do they work? How are they motivated? How can I get the best out of them? That can be a really strong foundation for all of the change, all of the work, all of the productivity that needs to happen on top of that. And the work that you're doing now is this, especially with the age of COVID, we're not traveling as much. Mm -hmm. Is this all work you do remotely or do you do on sites to get a vibe? How do you how do you approach that? Both. So the good news for me was that I was working quite a bit virtually before this. Um, I am a big believer in that technology can save us from a lot of heartache and we can do mm -hmm. a lot of things via Zoom. A lot can get done on a 30 minute phone call. There's lots of routes to that. Certainly there's work that needs to be done in person, but I have seen a lot of work um, happen really successfully. And it's even more important now virtually to say the team has to come together. We're gonna talk about what's going on. Let's not wait until we can be back in person. Let's figure out, out how to do that really well now too. That's awesome. So then obviously my next question is if someone is listening and they wanna get in touch with you, how would they best do that? Absolutely. Um, so my website is martinastoneconsulting.com. My email is martina at martinastoneconsulting.com. No one will forget my name. <laughs> um, and would love to hear from anyone with any question or any thought about anything we've talked about. Well, that's awesome. It's been such a pleasure having you on here today. And I feel like we could talk for another hour about specific <laughs> cases and what makes these things happen or not, or not work. Um, but I, I really enjoyed our time here today. You too. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, everyone, thank you for joining us today um, and joining us for another episode. And please hit subscribe. You can visit me on HassanArcher.com and on LinkedIn. And remember, if you have led meaningful change in your company, please reach out to me. Maybe we can interview you in a future episode.